and grandpa Let's wander back into the past Then paint me the picture Of long ago Welcome back to Hill Farms, the history of Hill Farms. Today we're going to take a side trip, uh, talk about one of our family's earlier businesses. Uh, wasn't here on the farm, but uh, it took place over in East Weisport, uh, the Pfeiffer Ice Dams, as most people know them. Today they're a place where kids go to play baseball and the community gathers for uh, events that the Lions put on and uh, th things of that nature. Uh, but years ago, we go back to the early 1900s, maybe 1910, let's say. Uh, one of our forefathers had an idea, and uh, we'll talk about that, Dad. Uh, the, how the ice dams got started? Well, uh, the area of the ice dams is once a celery farm. My great granddad, Lesher, he had raised celery there, and he, he was an entrepreneur. He he was a guy. He had he used to bring horses into the mountain, Kansas. See, at that time, horses were an important product because they were using them for plowing, and he'd go out and bring horses in, and and doing that, he met my great-grandmother out there and, and brought her home and they became husband and wife and that's where the family started. Then my grandfather married his daughter and uh, he started building the ice dams and it was done mainly with horses and a, a two-handled trough that he pulled the mud up on the banks with. Well yeah let's talk about uh, you say ice dams and people probably wonder you know ice dams what do you, what do you mean ice dams? There was well, a purpose there was a reason why uh, we're talking this is the early 1900s. Uh, there, were no electric refrigerators. There, there were no electric refrigerators so the, if you had something you want to keep cold you need to have an ice, yeah, box, an ice box and you yeah. put ice in it. So uh, today we manufacture ice in facilities but back then they used to harvest ice out in the wild. Uh, so that's where the idea came in. Let's uh, build a dam, and we can harvest our own ice. Right. So well, he built. He actually built uh, four dams. So there was four dams there. There were four dams there at one time. Uh, the one dam is has sort of disappeared, and in fact, there was a fifth dam that Lester Schaefer had where he raised minnows in. That one's now under the blacktop. But uh, that's some of the things that happened there. There was a big ice house right where you turn into Pfeiffer Park there. It was like a five-story high ice house, and there was a huge ice run that went up. It had like five different levels, and uh, as a kid, I remember, I must have been about three years old, because that's about the last, I believe, they harvested ice, but I can remember going up the ice run, and there was a place there was a saw that would saw the cake into the thickness they wanted, and then this cake would go thundering down the level they wanted, and it would go into the ice house, and there was guys in there with a long hook, and as this cake would come in, they'd hook it, and they'd swing it into place, and they put a whole row down, and then they put sawdust over it, and then the next row, and that's until they had the whole ice house full. So they, they, these weren't uh, modern facilities like today with all kinds of insulation. The insulation was sawdust. Yeah, they had a, they, they had a double wall building that they filled with sawdust. That was how they kept the ice, and I'd kept it all summer long. So they would go out and they would cut this ice with saws, uh, hand right. saws. And uh, there were runs that went from one dam to the other until you get over to the big run where it took it up into the ice house. Um, uh, as kids, as little kids, this was a really great to see this ice pull up the run and then it'd come shooting down into the water and it'd be a big splash, you know, and then they'd, they'd get it on the next one. Uh, but uh, the runs were all connected uh, to the dams that they could get them all to that center area where it went up into the ice house. It's amazing how smart our forefathers were, but they didn't have the equipment. Uh, uh, must the have been technology, but the way they laid things out uh, to help minimize the, the impact of labor. I can't imagine what the investment was because the business really didn't last that long and uh, I don't think yeah. they ever made much money on it. It was uh, Another example of technology to doing away with business. Well, uh, along came uh, uh, the natural ice production was too erratic. You, My forefather and my grandfather depended on having one cutting by January 1st. Now that meant the ice had to be about a foot thick. And uh, you talk about global warming, well there's an example of it, uh, the day you wouldn't get a, a foot of ice by January 1st. Yeah, so that was a short-lived business, uh, probably didn't make a whole lot of money, but uh, hopefully they learned something. Uh, well, they tried, I mean they tried, uh, after the ice dams, of course, Walter Schaefer came in there and he was married to Pfeiffer's daughter, and he had chickens and turkeys over that whole area, that whole area where the ball field is and around the dams, that became a chicken and turkey farm, and a big one. And in fact, there's where I got my 
made the first mistake of when I was 13 years old. I wanted to prove that I could lift a 100-pound bag of food, and I ended up uh, emptying railroad cars after that. Yeah, that's a lesson to be learned to all the <laughs> young kids out there. Yeah. Uh, watch how you show off. Yeah. But anyway, that was, so that was really like the first uh, modern-day uh, free-range chicken operation. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he, uh, he, had, um, he had a lot of tough breaks. I mean, once again, private business like that. I remember one year he had the turkeys ready for Thanksgiving about about a month or maybe two weeks before Thanksgiving, the turkeys started dying. Nobody even knew why they were dying. And beautiful birds, I mean, we ended up getting them, we were raising mink at the time, and we ended up getting them for mink food. Uh, he just had a lot of tough, like two of his, eyes, two of his chicken houses burned down. And, uh, so there was a lot was, of businesses that were in that area. Well, once was a swamp, was uh, turned into the ice dams, and then uh, numerous other things after uh, that. Uh, my cousin Lester, who was his son, started raising shiners and had a bait business there for a while. And then along came a man when they finally died out, they sold it off, and a man by the name of Erdman from Allentown bought it, and he had to pay for fish place there. Uh -huh. And he stocked it with trout, but it wasn't, a, the water's a little too warm for trout. It, 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 it yeah. didn't, it was another business that just didn't make it. I mean, it, it failed. So the ice dam started to fill in, I remember, as a kid growing up over there in East Wiseport. Uh, it sort of got uh, run down, the, the dam started filling in, uh, but it always wild. was, a. Uh, Still, even though uh, at that point it was a central location in the community, uh, it was used as ice skating in the in the winter time, uh, summertime. Kids fished around there. There was a center uh, for fishing, bullfrog hunting. Uh, yeah. We'd shoot snakes, and uh, there was, it was always a load of water. I had muskrats. One year, I caught over sixty muskrats around those dams. This is the way kids entertained themselves uh, years ago. Well, that wasn't uh, even entertainment. You know, trapping was a big thing in those days. Uh, but that's. Uh, <laughs> That's the time, and this goes back, the ice skating goes back, uh, it was a, uh, an area where all the kids got together. Uh, you know, that today, uh, it's, with the yeah, we built there. a fire in the bank, and um, that was back in the days, I guess, of chivalry, where you'd see the guys lacing up the girls' skate, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, boyfriend, girlfriend thing, and... Uh, yeah. yeah, and an interesting part of the story here is, is uh, how the ice man delivered the ice to the houses. So. Uh, that was a big time for the kids uh, and the parents both getting their ice uh, and their ice chips. Parents used to hang a sign in the window, 25 cent piece, 50 cent piece. 25 cent piece would be about that big, 50 cent piece would be half the keg, and a dollar would be the whole keg. And the guy had a canvas bag, he'd put the ice in, put it in his shoulder, take it in, put it in your ice box. Of course the women had a, or the people in the house had to be responsible for getting the water out because there was always a tub of water yeah. as it melted, but it, it kept for several days. And of course, to kids, it was a big deal because when the ice man came, it meant we were going to get chips. And when he chipped the ice, you know, he'd generally leave us, scrape up a few of them, you know, and we'd be able to suck on his ice. It may seem simple today, but yeah. it was a big deal to us. <laughs> yeah, so much uh, yeah. For, for kids, the things that they were amused yeah. by. And that, was a, that was a big treat. Yeah. So, so then on another side note, uh, you know, and this is kind of interesting, the small world that we live in. So my great-grandfather, made the ice up here. He harvested the ice, put it in ice houses, and sold it. I meet a girl, my wife, her family's from Philadelphia. Her great-grandfather sold ice in Philadelphia. So, you know, worlds apart, but uh, interconnected, uh, as so many times we find life is. So it's, it's hard to believe, you know, two people uh, meet up from so far apart and we have such an intertwined history, uh, you know, of how the two families interacted. Even though we didn't directly sell to each other, uh, the fact that they both were in the ice business uh, shows the importance of the ice industry. It was an important part of the, of the community in a lot of ways. So, uh, Yeah, those dams really were. They today, were the center of the whole community. they're moving down the, uh, the, the war monument from the elementary school uh, right. to there to the ice dam. So uh, you know, the war dead will be honored. Those are the people. There's 29 they, boys that lost their lives that we know of. There was about 54 in the Civil War that we don't know what happened to them. They were draftees and the records burned up. But there's at least, there's 29 we know of that were killed in combat from the Civil War up till uh, Desert Storm. And that monument's gonna be there above the ice dam. And I would say that every one of those boys at one time or other was around those dams. So it's probably appropriate place. I just hope the vandals don't damage that because they've had a little problem with vandalism there. It's amazing. Sometimes these things sit there and people pass them and look at them every day and they don't really realize the importance that they have in the community and that uh, those well, ice dams really were a big This part monument had been under the flagpole at the school. That's yeah. where my class of 1988, uh, we worked together to put that monument up and the community donated the funds and it's really community property. Yes. 
So that's an appropriate place for it to, you know, for its final resting spot. Well, there. the Lions Club's agreed to take it, and they're, yeah, and they're involved there at the ice stands now. So, so people don't realize, uh, you know, really, they know them as the fight for ice stands, but a lot of people don't know what took place there over well, the years. A lot of but, different uh, things. But that, uh, you know, our family was, uh, you know, it's called Pfeiffer's Corner. Uh, our family yeah. really had a big influence as to what took place there, and, and uh, it's great to see that's going to live on, uh, hopefully, for many years as a, as a community center. So, yeah, I hope so. Uh, good for the kids. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed our little side trip here to uh, East Weisport to talk about the Pfeiffer Ice Dams, and like I said, uh, some of the, the early the early businesses our family got uh, tied up with, and, uh, you know, that help shape us to where we are here today. So uh, tune in for another episode uh, of the History of Hill Farms. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy our series, The History of Hill Farms. If you have any questions about anything that you've seen in the video, please uh, post a, a question in the comments section and we'll try to get back to you. Also, if there's anything you'd like to see in future episodes, please let us know. Thanks a lot. Grandpa, tell me about the good old days.